Hi, everyone. If you're here, we got a few minutes or a few seconds, I guess, till four. I'm putting some uh, links and different stuff on the chat room here quick before we get started, which will be shortly. Hope everyone's having a good day. It's been a good day here in Pier, weather-wise, that's for sure. All right. Uh, I think we'll get started. Hello, everyone. It's uh, Wednesday. It's four o'clock, which means it's time for the South Dakota State Archives online office hours. I'm Matthew Reitzel. I'm the manuscript and photo archivist with the South Dakota State Archives. And we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, making donations to the South Dakota State Archives, specifically uh, manuscript collections, which is what I deal with. So uh, over in the uh, chat box there, I put up a few things. There's our email. The A R C H R E F, that's arcref at state.sd.us, um, or my email is up there as well, matthew.reitzel at state.sd.us. And there's also a link to our donation page where you can find our donation form. Um, so let's see here. Last week, uh, Nicole talked about Chronicling America and the South Dakota newspapers that are currently available online. Uh, the week before that, uh, Sarah talked about recent news from the state archives and resources you can find online. We've also had history from home scavenger hunts and also puzzles of historical images from our collections, which you can find on Facebook. So be sure to go back and uh, check those things out when you have time. Um, so the first week, um, oh, the other thing too is if you do have any questions, uh, please put them in the uh, the chat box there. I'll either catch them or other state state archive staff are uh, here online as well. So hopefully between all of us, um, and if we don't see one when we're live here, we'll try and get it later and uh, hopefully get you an answer. So uh, the first week of archives online, uh, we got a question from Glenna who said um, asked, as we clean out our ancestors' belongings, is there something you would particularly want? For your collection? Well, Glenda, the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is it depends on what you have and what you can tell me about it. So um, it is a good time to go through stuff. Um, there's a lot of people who've, who've been digging through their family stuff. We've been contacted um, quite a few times since uh, this pandemic stuff started, which is a good thing that we've been contacted. And um, I talked yesterday on the phone with a woman from Connecticut whose family was from the Huron area and they're looking to donate stuff and um, just being in contact by email also been receiving regular mail as well with collections so things are still coming in so the plan for this um, online office hour is to talk a little about about who we are South Dakota State Archives the kind of things we collect specifically uh, concerning the manuscript collections which is what I deal with um, what we take in some things that we do not take in and examples of what we have taken recently and with over the past few years. So, again, this is Matthew Reitzel. Uh, this is uh, Archives Online Hours through the South Dakota State Archives. So, first and foremost, um, the first thing I would tell you is please contact us first. Um, if you have a collection of something, if you have something you're thinking of donating to us, please contact us uh, right now. Email is the best way, and again, the top of this chat um, included both our ARC reference email and also my email as well. That's the best way to get a hold of us. Um, or you can go to our website, history.sd.gov slash archives, and um, let me see, where did I put this? Let's see, let me go back. Um, but anyway, you can go to our website and um, find information that way. Again, that's history, 
.sd.gov slash archives. Um, and then we'll be able to get you to the right person. Uh, specifically, again, I'm the manuscript archivist, so that's kind of the stuff that I deal with. And uh, a good reason to why you should contact people beforehand. So we received uh, a letter that came from another state archives, uh, postcards. And within the note, it had said, um, here's some postcards from your great state. Uh, the postcards were of Mount Rushmore and the Black Hills, but the original donor had mailed it to the South Carolina State Archives. So it didn't go to the right state. South Carolina State Archives forwarded it to us, and we finally got in touch with the donor. So please always get in touch with us to make sure you're uh, going to the right place. Uh, and then also note as well, when I'm talking about stuff, if I talk about certain subjects or themes or different time periods in history, it doesn't mean that we don't want something you might have. I'm just kind of making a reference to um, the kind of collections that we get here at the State Archives. And um, however, we can't collect everything. That would be impossible. We would need a huge archives to collect uh, all the history of our state. Um, but we do, we're always looking for things uh, and hoping that you will get in touch with us uh, and contact us. And uh, the best time to donate something um, to put it bluntly, is uh, before you pass away. Uh, don't assume that either your children uh, or someone who's going to deal with your property later is going to look at a box of stuff and say, oh, this must be important. Let's donate it somewhere. Um, the assumption is on you uh, to take responsibility for donating uh, and documenting your collections beforehand. Um, and I would also note, too, um, the South Dakota State Archives is not the only place you can donate materials. There's a number of university archives, other uh, county historical societies, museums, town archives, things like that. So uh, keep them in mind as well. Sometimes it would be better for those uh, to be at a university or a local archives or museum. Some places don't have uh, such a thing. So keep that in mind as well when you're looking for a place to uh, donate your materials. Here we go. Okay. Um, so a little background uh, on the State Historical Society. Uh, it originated from the Old Settlers Association of Dakota Territory in 1862. The society officially established its relationship with state government in 1901. Uh, originally, the Historical Society was housed in the South Dakota State Capitol. Uh, the society moved across the street to the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Building in 1932 which is more well known as the Robinson Museum. Uh, the South Dakota State Legislature officially created the South Dakota State Archives in 1975. Uh, the State Archives and the State Historical Society moved to the 63,000 square foot Cultural Heritage Center in 1989. And uh, that's where we're uh, housed today. Uh, there are five programs within the South Dakota State Historical Society. There's the archives, Museum, the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, Press, and Archaeology. Archaeology is located out in Rapid City. Uh, and we'd always ask, it's always a good time to become a member of the State Historical Society and uh, promote our programs uh, that we have at the, with the Historical Society. So um, I kind of got my chat thing figured out. Um, I see Kathy has some ancestors from Norway. Uh, a lot of South Dakotans have that um from all different periods all different places so so yeah um so within the state archives there are three main categories of collections uh, so there's the library materials uh, the government collections and then the manuscript collections so i'm going to put in a link here hopefully uh, to the uh library index uh, for the South Dakota State Archives. So if you have any books that are you, you're looking to donate uh, to us, you can always check out that index first. But again, be sure to get in touch with our librarian, Kim Smith, as well. Uh, and she'd be the ones who handles the library materials. And then there's the government and manuscript collections. Um, so when you hear someone say manuscript item, what does that mean? So there's really two ways to define what a manuscript uh, collection is. The first is that it's non-published. So um, 
obviously a book, a journal, things like that. Those are more for a library, not necessarily considered a manuscript collection. Also, manuscript collections are not government created. So minutes of game, fish, and parks, a report from the Department of Health, that's not a manuscript collection, it's a government collection. So manuscript items tend to be personal items, uh, things that people create um, to remember an event or things that they create on their own. So that could be anything from letter letters, diaries, scrapbooks, uh, photo albums, and also things too like uh, film, uh, audio recordings, transcripts, and uh, research notes. So any kind of personal items that a person would create. Um, one other thing to keep in mind, uh, also in that field of manuscript collections, is also organizational and company records. That's another thing people don't think about too often uh, when it comes to historical collections, but they're certainly the kind of things that we have at the State Archives, and I'll give some examples of that um, after a bit. Um, and as always, once I say, you know, a manuscript is not published, then there's a rule that says we take published stuff. The, the two examples of that are maps and postcards. Uh, those are the two things that I also deal with quite a bit that are mass produced. They're not necessarily uh, personal items, but they tend to come my way. So there's always that kind of gray area when we're trying to figure out what kind of collection it is. So what we do um, when those materials come to the state archives is we uh, use another fancy archives word, which is accession. We accession the materials uh, at the state archives. And that means three different things. <clears throat> um, first is that it is a legal transfer of records to the archives. Second is uh, those materials are put into a catalog um, and put into a database of some sort. And then the final thing uh, is that the items are made available to the public. Um, so when their materials are accessioned, um, like I said, they officially are transferred basically to the state of South Dakota. Um, and it's our job then to be responsible for those items, uh, make sure they're preserved, kept safe, and the correct um, asset tree materials uh, and things like that. We don't loan stuff out at state archives. If we have a diary from 1890, no one can come and check it out like it's a library book. Uh, once things are transferred to the state archives, they stay uh, in the building. Uh, you can access them in the research room, and we can make copies and scans and things like that for you. But um, it's meant to stay in the state archives. Um, and then uh, the other big thing, too, is that once we have all these materials back in our collections, we're able to find it. Um, I had one researcher. He was working on different stuff, and he'd actually been at the archives years before doing research and um, we were having some trouble finding stuff because he just had a photocopy and he didn't remember where it came from. And I made a note to him that it's always easy to find it uh, once, but it's harder to find a collection again. But that's why we have all those indexes and databases so people can find information. Uh, and then the third part of that is uh, that we take this information that's donated to us and we make it available to researchers so they can do uh, all different types of history, family history, uh, academic history, maybe it's just something local they've always been interested in and stuff like that. So uh, we also have uh, um, we have a mission statement and a collection policy, which I won't uh, uh, read through, but um, I'll put a link here in the comment section. Um, and hopefully those are showing up. I'm kind of seeing them here. And um, but that you can just read our mission statement and collection policy. When, when you boil all that down, there's basically three big things we do, which I've kind of already talked about. We collect, preserve, make accessible uh, the history of South Dakota. Um, within that mission statement, there was one sentence here that I did pull out. And, and it says, seeks out and acquires collections revealing the history of South Dakota from various time periods. And that's pretty broad, and it's kind of meant to do that on purpose, I think, uh, so that we don't want to pigeonhole ourselves into saying we only take one thing or another. If it has something to do with South Dakota, if it has something to do with South Dakotans, we're going to have an interest in it at the South Dakota State Archives. And I've always seen that as being an advantage that we have such a, 
a wide range of things we're looking to collect from from all over the state. Um, again, this is Matthew Reitzel, uh, the South Dakota State Archives online hours. Um, if you do have any questions, if anyone's watching, um, you can put them on the side there. Um, I think the staff has mostly been getting them. Um, let me take a look here. And again, if you go to the top of this, um, uh, to the chat section, it has the email for the ArcRef, uh, our state archives email, and also mine as well. And I'm going to try to put those at the bottom again, too. So, uh, okay. So, there's three questions I tend to get asked the most, uh, being the manuscript archivist at the South Dakota State Archives. So the first question I get is, would you want six boxes of National Geographic magazine? So the answer to that is no. Uh, we do not have an interest in National Geographic magazine. And oddly enough, it's never five boxes or seven boxes. It's always six. So I don't know why that is. but. Um, there is some history of South Dakota in National Geographic magazine. Most of that uh, is around the straddle bull flights from the 30s. Um, but things like maps of Virginia, photos of Chicago, or letters of George Washington are not the kind of materials that you would find at the South Dakota State Archives. So there's better places. Maps of Virginia should be in Virginia. Photos of Chicago in Chicago. Uh, letters of George Washington should be uh, in George Washington's Mount Vernon. So uh, there was a good uh, article a few years back um, uh, concerning archivists, and it noted them as being keepers or selectors. Most people see us as being keepers, like we'll just pull and grab anything we want as long as it's old, and if it has dust on it, even better, and we're just going to keep it when actually we're more like selectors. Um, when we get stuff in, when stuff comes to my desk, um, there's always that time to kind of look at it and decide, does this fit in our mission statement? Is this something that we already have in our collections? Um, is this something that we would even want? So we have those conversations as well, and we are selectors um, of items. So the other questions I tend to get are, you probably already have this, or you probably don't want this. Um, and again, I don't know until I know what it is you have, um, and then I kind of work my way from there. Uh, a few years back, we had a gentleman come into the State Archives who had this uh, panoramic framed photograph of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad Bridge here in Pier. And the neat thing was, about it was the photographer was out, uh, either out in a sandbar uh, on the Missouri River, or he was in uh, one of the boats or something, but it's basically looking straight on, um, and you get the whole width of the bridge. It's just a photo I've never seen before. You always see it taken from land and stuff like that, so just a fascinating photograph, and of course, he asked those questions. You probably already have this. You probably don't want this, and the answer was, um, we don't have it, and yes, we would very much like it, and he donated to that, that to us, and uh, it's a great photo. Uh, that we have in our collection. Um, another important thing to bring up is, uh, and, and, and whenever I get a contact from someone by email uh, or telephone, I always describe to them the importance of historical context. And to me, this is probably the most important thing uh, concerning any donation that someone's going to make to the State Archives or, or anywhere else. Um, but it's often the last thing or something that you don't even think about. Basically, what historic context is, is providing background uh, on the individual, the family, an event or an organization, whatever you're dealing with. It's that history of behind the collection. A lot of times people just assume because something is old that it means it's important, um, which it might be, but we need that extra background history. Uh, the the who, where, when, what, things like that. Um, as I tell people, if you've ever donated thing to the archives, you've probably heard this uh, before, but it doesn't need to be the next great American novel or anything like that, but you have to be able to give some description and some history of what those items are. So for example, let's say that we have a photo album uh, and there's a number of photographs from the time period. We could say it's from the 20s, um, it has a lot of farm stuff, so it's probably agriculture related in some ways. 
but we don't know who the people are. We don't know where they were at. Uh, we can guess the time frame. We know a little bit about what's going on, I guess. It's a cool photo album, but we don't have that historical context, that background for it. Um, it just adds more to the collection to say, this is Jim and Jane Doe's farm, and they lived in Lincoln County. Um, this was the time period they were there, and these were their kids' names. So based on the age of the kids, we can kind of figure out what the time period was for all this. And it just brings the collection all together. Um, so historical context, remember to think of that when you have family items, um, letters, any kind of materials, what's that background information? Because once it gets donated to the state archives, if we don't have that history, it's going to be hard for us to kind of pull some of that out. And and we can do that. There are ways we can find a little more history on stuff. But if, um, if someone contacts me and they say, I have this collection of stuff and here's the history of the whole family, it just makes it uh, that much better for the collection itself. Um, another important thing to keep in mind is the condition of the materials. Uh, generally, you know, is it a real mess? <laughs> Uh, has it been sitting in a basement or an attic for years? Is it moldy? Is it falling apart? Um, I had someone contact us one time who had a collection of films. And they wanted me to look at it, and they said they're not the greatest. And I came and looked at them, and they were they were just fried. They were they were gone. <laughs> you couldn't do anything with those. No amount of conservation work was going to be able to fix that. Um, so that just kind of ended that conversation right away. And that's another good thing to point out too, as archivists, we deal with preservation of items. However we get it, we're gonna wanna keep it that way, stabilize it so it'll last for years to come. Whereas a conservator is a person who would fix items. So we, we do not fix things, we are not conservators. We just deal in preservation, keeping things the way they are um, when we get them. Uh, another question we tend to ask ourselves is does the donation have research or historical value. Um, one of the things, another thing I get questioned about somewhat often is about getting appraisals for stuff. Um, we're not interested in monetary appraisal of items, we're interested in the appraisal of its historic value. How is this important to South Dakota's history? What does this tell us about South Dakota history? Does this tell us something um, we've never heard of before or can we juxtapose this collection with another one to kind of show two sides um, or two different aspects of the same story. Um, and then another thing too is does a donation um, cover more than one topic in history? And not everything covers multiple topics, but uh, I'll have some examples here later that when we, you know, if we get this collection in, can we say someone who is interested in this topic would find it interesting, but also in this topic too and this one over here. So different researchers can come at it from a different point of view and get um, historical information from it. Um, I'd also note too that um, our friends over at the Museum of the State Historical Society, we work with them quite often for various things and a lot of times collections have both um, paper and photograph materials but also the three-dimensional artifact um, kind of stuff and we work with them. We're all in the same building um, but we're kind of separated where they deal with museum stuff, we deal with archival stuff, but uh, we work together uh, to make sure that those unique collections where we're getting both archival and museum items um, can make it into the building. Um, another important thing too, uh, and then I'll show some examples here, is the importance of recent history. Uh, since I've been working at State Archives, we've always uh, maybe not emphasized this, but at least saying, you know, more recent history um, is important too. There is no time frame where history starts and everything behind that is important um, and everything in between is not. So it's not just World War II and back, for example, that's important. There's a lot more recent history and things that have been going on as well. And uh, with that in mind, uh, I'm gonna remind you to uh, take a look at our COVID-19 website. Um, we've gotten a few um, hits on that with some information. Again, another good point of uh, recent history. Uh, and um, it's always good to find, um, like I said, any kind of thing you can think of. I know I have a photo um, of my daughter at Walmart with all of the toilet paper and paper towels gone. 
Uh, I need, I keep telling myself I need to donate that and send it to the website. And uh, I always keep forgetting, I guess. But um, please keep that in mind. Uh, keep recent historical events in mind, too. Um, uh, it looks like some of the other staff have been uh, doing the questions, which is good. I haven't. Uh, Hey, Kelly, how are you doing? I see you're in there. Um, and we are located at the Cultural Heritage Center in Pier. Um, it's the building in the hill if you've never been there before. Um, so yeah. Um, so the, the, what I wanted to wrap up here uh, was just giving you guys a few examples um, of some of the different items we, we get in and, and some we've gotten recently and others we've had uh, over the years. So um, one manuscript, Reminiscence, basically, we've received. It's titled My Story. 1914-1948, Margaret Vogelsong Lloyd. Um, this was an 87-page manuscript. The, the family was living in Los Angeles in 1941, and then they moved to South Dakota. Uh, they lived along uh, False Bottom Creek south of Belle Fouche, and this is just a reminiscence of growing up in South Dakota in the 1940s. Uh, the interesting thing about this manuscript collection Parts of it were published in the spring 2019 issue of South Dakota History. So some of it was published, but the manuscript eventually came to the state archives. Um, if uh, you follow us on Facebook uh, religiously, which I'm sure all of you do, of course, um, there was a note about the uh, Harriet Witcher Diaries. Um, and this is a uh, 37 years worth of diaries from uh, the Hidden Timber, South Dakota area in Todd County. And this was a good example of uh, a collection that covers different topics. Obviously, you have uh, a, a diary of a woman in South Dakota, the various uh, things that she had to deal with um, going through that time period. But there's the agriculture uh, issues in the 20s, uh, the Great Depression of the 30s, home front, World War II in the 40s, and aftermath and stuff like that. Uh, her and her husband were also very, uh, they worked a lot with the American Legion and Auxiliary. So there's a lot of that history uh, in those as well. So when you have a diary that is that long of a uh, time period, obviously it's going to cover a lot of bases. But that's something um, that we're interested in as well. Um, recently received a collection, uh, an envelope actually, that had two postcards in it. Uh, from a town of Dixon, South Dakota, which is in Gregory County. Um, we only have a small handful of images of Dixon to start with. We had three. Uh, with the two other postcards, we now have five. So um, like I said earlier, we don't have everything. You know, don't assume that just because it's an old photograph of a town, it means that we uh, have it. That's kind of hard to say. So again, always keep us in mind. Um, drop us an email. Again, at that ArcRef email or at my personal email, which is at the top of the chat chain, and I'll also put it at the bottom before we close up. Um, another good collection of stuff is the uh, R.C. Lathrop collection. Uh, R.C. Lathrop worked for the railroad for over 40 years. Uh, he collected a lot of South Dakota-related railroad photographs, town depots, um, trains, everything you can think of, I guess, concerning railroads. Um, and then in the 70s and 80s, he also took a lot of photographs um, from that time period. So it was a wealth of information, a lot of different stuff. There's photographs, uh, maps, times tables. He also worked with the railroad union as well. Uh, and that amounted to 32 cubic feet of record. So about 32 boxes worth of stuff, which I refer to as van load. And for those who are curious, van load is an official archival term. Uh, so it was a lot of stuff. And um, so this is a good example of, for one, not only did R.C. Lathrop have uh, the photographs and archival material, he also had museum, museum items, which he donated to the Museum of the Historical Society as well. So we both got stuff uh, from the one person, and, and that was great. Um, the R.C. Lathrop collection, um, you can go to the South Dakota Digital Archives and find a, let's see if I can get this here. Um, there's a link there to that collection. There's over 630 
railroad photographs uh, online, um, which you could find that way. Uh, so it's an extensive collection of stuff. And this is good to, to show against the Dixon stuff. So the Dixon photo photos, it was two postcards that came in an envelope, whereas the RC, RC Lathrop stuff, it was an extensive collection. So we take small things and big things. Um, so keep that in mind as well. And then the last one here I want to wrap up with is the, uh, there was a rededication of the Civil War Monument and Pier, uh, which happened back in 2015, which I was there and kind of worked with that rededication. Ben, it doesn't seem like it was five years ago, um, but it was five years ago. So that's another good example of the recent history uh, that we're looking to keep. Um, there was a peer photographer there, uh, Keith Hemmelman, took uh, 114 images uh, from that event, and he donated those to the South Dakota State Archives. And one of the interesting things with that collection is there were no prints, there were no negatives, it was all digital materials. So that is something that State Archives has been working on uh, over the last uh, several years is how are we gonna start collecting these digital materials? And we do get things um, digitally, both scanned or born digital, and we are able to now take those digital materials, run them through our digital preservation program, and uh, store them uh, just like a letter or a photograph, um, it's just that we're preserving them in a different way now. So um, then lastly, I, I briefly talked about organizational records. Um, and I just want to kind of um, add to that a little bit. So there's different organizations throughout the state. Some of them are connected with other national groups. Some of them are local. Um, some of the statewide and local ones you might be familiar with. And I'm just going to read through some of these here. South Dakota General Federation of Women's Clubs, Grand Army of the Republic Records, Independent Order of Odd Fellows, American Legion and Auxiliary, South Dakota Business and Professional Women, and South Dakota Women's Christian Temperance Union. So again, these are names, groups, organizations you've probably heard of before. Um, so maybe it's obvious that we would collect things like that. But here's a list of some of the not so obvious, and some of these we've gotten uh, over the last few years. So there's the South Dakota Dental Assistance Association, uh, South Dakota Garden Clubs, South Dakota Arborists Association, the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association of South Dakota, Peer Circle 8 Square Dance Club, South Dakota Unit of the Wally Bynum Caravan Club International, and South Dakota Flying Farmers and Ranchers. So, so there's different clubs and groups. We collect minutes and bylaws and newsletters and all kinds of things like that. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, sometimes it's personal items that you have that involves your family. Sometimes it's the history and work of an organization. And um, we have been adding materials to archive space, uh, both government and manuscript collections. Um, with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, one of the things we've kind of been focused on a little bit more because we can do this at home is the Archive Space website. And since um, recently, we just kind of passed a little bit of a milestone, I guess, but we have all of our manuscript collections from 2000 to the present uh, on the South Dakota Digital Archives. And that's searchable, uh, um, the actual, materials aren't scanned or anything like that. It's just an index to the collections that we have. Um, and from 2000 to the present, that includes 1,775 uh, individual manuscript collections. So that's something you can go and do some digging through online um, and uh, find out information about the state archives that way. So again, I'm going to include, uh, I've seen it in a few other spots here, I guess. I'm going to include our ArcRef email. Uh, also going to have my own work email. Um, please feel, like I said at the start, please feel free to give us an email. Email works best. Um, as of right now, we don't have any kind of regular office hours. Um, by any means, hopefully that'll change uh, over the next uh, few weeks. Um, but you can always contact us uh, by email and um, kind of go from there. So the plan 
for next week's uh, archives online hours. Again, it'll be next Wednesday at four o'clock. Uh, we're going to do a talk about uh, South Dakota Digital Archives, which I just referenced here, um, and the various things you can find on there. That includes photographs, maps, survey notes, uh, and both manuscript and government collections. Um, so that's all I have. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, you can uh, send them this way now, or like I said, please drop us an email. Um, so let's see. Uh, hey, Bob Colby, how are you doing? Uh, you asked, is there a size limit to items collected? Uh, generally not. Uh, like I said, the RC Lathrop stuff was 32 cubic feet of records. That's a lot of space. Um, we've recently received some authors' research materials. Um, and um, so that's just another way of it, it kind of depends. Uh, the bigger stuff is harder for us to uh, sometimes get to peer, depending on where it comes from. Um, uh, Scott Nelson uh, mentioned with the photograph donation, do the rights for the photos also transfer to the archives? The short answer is yes. We, we generally ask that they do, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, we have some older photograph collections when the, in the archives where it, where it says to contact the donor if someone wants to use a photograph. Well, the donor died 50 years ago, and we don't know who to contact now, and it makes it harder for people to use those collections. I've, we've had authors um, and, and other individuals go into things, and they just look at it and say, I don't even want to mess with it. They don't, they don't work with it. Um, we can work with the photographers, I guess, uh, on that. And usually the photographs we get are older ones. Uh, the, the reference I made to Keith Hemlin from Pierre, those were transferred to the state archives um, and available for other people to use. So that is a good question. And when you get into photo issues, that's a whole other bag of water, kind of. Um, so I'm just kind of going back through some of the Um, Kathy has a question about the Norwegian Vaughn Church near Yankton. I don't know exactly what um, records we may or may not have. If it's on the National Register of Historic Places, it's possible that the SHPO office has those materials. Um, that might be a good place to go. Um, and I think, see, so yeah, I think I got the Bob Colby question and the Scott question. Um, and again, if you have any other more specific questions, uh, please, again, please email us. Um, let us know uh, how we can help you out, I guess. Um, well, I'll wait a few more minutes here, um, see if there's any other questions. Any early, uh, Kathy asked a question, any early 1900s wife records? Um, I'm not, that might be a good government uh, records question. I don't have a good answer for that off the top of my head. Um, I don't know if we're officially licensed or anything like that. So the short answer is I'm not sure, <laughs> which is maybe a good way to answer a lot of different questions. But Kathy, you can always drop us a line and we can do a little more digging to see what kind of stuff um, we can have. Um, yeah, I'll hang out here a little bit longer if there's any more questions. Um, yeah, uh, always um, please be sure to, to get in touch with us. Um, our donation form, the link for that was uh, towards the top uh, of the chat. Um, and um, yeah, it, I don't, I didn't mean to be morbid about that, but um, when it comes to donating stuff, but it really helps if you're able to donate materials before you pass away because um, I've gotten a lot of collections where someone just walks in with a box of stuff and they plop it on the counter and they say, I don't really know what this is. Um, they thought it was important and they know a little bit of history. Maybe it's a niece or, you or something like that. Um, but um, always write that stuff down. Um, be sure to let other people know what your wishes are. 
for stuff like that. If you can put it into your journal, that would be fantastic um, because then someone can contact us directly. And every, you know, like I said, everything's taken care of beforehand. But um, um, let's see. Uh, what is the life of digital materials? Um, that might be another question for another uh, archives hour, but the goal is it would last forever, I think. Uh, that's the plan. That's the way we are treating our digital collections, that they will last um, well into the future. Uh, there's different things that are done. Digital files, uh, like converting them to a correct format so that they will last years from now and it won't be something where you need a Windows 94 or something in order to open it. So we are uh, working, we have been working on that for the last few years. There is a program that everything runs through, creates metadata and all different kinds of things um, that are kind of hard to describe uh, uh, over a Facebook Live, I guess. Um, but as Sarah mentioned there, uh, as long as they're managed properly, and that is what we're doing with those digital files. So. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Unless there are any other questions uh, that come up again, please contact us, uh, the ARC ref at state at sd.us. Remember to put the H in there. That H is kind of tricky. It's A-R-C-H-R-E-F at state.sd.us. My email was in here a couple times. And uh, yeah, this is Matthew Reitzel, Manuscript and Photo Archivist with the South Dakota State Archives. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.